Our speaker this hour is Dr. Willie Nettle, affectionately known by me as Brother Willie. He serves as a pulpit minister and one of the five shepherds for the Bypass Congregation in Vicksburg, Mississippi, which he and his family planted in 1987. In 2005, he helped to orchestrate a successful merger between the predominantly white Magnolia Congregation and the then predominantly black Bypass Church, resulting in the now integrated Bypass Church of about 120 people. I've done uh, meetings there, and it's one of my favorite places to go uh, in my home state of Mississippi. Brother Willie received his BA degree in 1983 from Magnolia Bible College, where I had him as one of my students, and I might say one of the very best students you know, that I've ever had. He has a Master's of Theology uh, 1987 and a Doctor of Ministry in 2004 uh, from Harding School of Theology in Memphis. He was the first black student to receive the Doctor of Ministry degree from Harding School of Theology. He and his good wife Robin have been married for 37 years. And where is Sister Robin sitting? Could I see a hand? There she is back there. And so we welcome you, uh, Sister Robin. They have two children, William Nettle and Lydia Dotson, and they have three precious grandchildren. In addition to his work with the local congregation, uh, Dr. Nettle preaches each year on various lectureships, college campuses, gospel meetings. He conducts various workshops on different themes. He serves as adjunct faculty for what is now called Magnolia Bible Institute in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. And he also uh, is adjunct for the School of Religious Studies in North Little Rock, Arkansas. He serves as a board member for the, of the Center for Pregnancy Choices and also for Lifting Lives Ministry, which operates a 20-room shelter for homeless families in Vicksburg. He has been preaching the gospel of Christ for over 40 exciting and fruitful years. And I have just learned that today is his birthday. And so I would like for all of us to join in in saying happy birthday. Happy birthday. That was pretty weak. Can we do that again? Happy birthday. All right. And I should mention this, and I should have done this before your introduction, Brother Willie, so I apologize. But this is probably a matter that needs some attention. Um, <clears throat> a Rusty Wallace Kia Optima, a loaner car, is parked in a small parking lot, I understand, that way. Am I right about that? Can I see an elder's hand somewhere? Am I correct? Okay, over there. Thank you, Dave. And it is blocking the trash dumpster. And, um, and so the, the people who uh, collect that are not able to get to it. And believe me, we have a lot of... Uh, uh, things that are being disposed right now. So we really need that attended to. So if you could help us in moving that car, we would greatly appreciate it. And if the person who owns it is not here, if you know who that might be, if you could mention that to them, we would appreciate it very much. Now, Brother Nettle. The Christian and racism. And when uh, the lectureship committee was putting this together and this topic came up, I said, I know one man who will do an incredible job on a rather sensitive topic in our culture today. And that person is Dr. Willie Nettle. Good morning. How do you follow an introduction like that? <laughs> you have to take a pen and pop the balloon. Appreciate that, Brother David. Brother David is one of my favorite people. We've had him for gospel meetings there in Vicksburg. He always does an excellent job. He's an excellent uh, instructor of the word. I often say that we, we trained him well at Magnolia Bible College as he made his way from there to Freed Hardeman and, and all the other places that he's served, always doing a great work. 
and I appreciated him so much in the classes that we had at Magnolia Bible College. Today is my birthday, but it'll be a better birthday once I get this presentation over. <laughs> this is a very sensitive topic, and I will share some things that I want you to think about, want you to ponder, want you to uh, grow on and think about as you go forward. We'll only touch the hem of the garment. There's so much to cover. And I thought about the topic when he gave it to me way back uh, the end of 2021. Uh, and I thought about how can you cover that in 40 minutes? There's so much to cover. Uh, but I do want to share some personal things as we begin this morning and think about this particular topic. On April 24th, 2005, in the southern city of Vicksburg, Mississippi, the predominantly white Magnolia Church of Christ, served by their preacher, Wayne Moore, merged with the predominantly black Bypass Church of Christ, served by their preacher, Willie Nettle, thereby forming the newly integrated Bypass Church of Christ. And the members from both emerging groups decided to live out the reality that God has destroyed that middle wall of hostility, separating both Jew and Gentile. And we would say separating black and white, separating uh, different cultures that are, are assembling in different places. But God has torn down that wall and brought these two races together. God had made them one. God had made them one through Christ and the Holy Spirit. Uh, in a divided world that still preaches racism, prejudice, hatred, the same God who made these diverse people, his sons and daughters, also made them to be one in Christ Jesus. And as Paul would say in Colossians 3 and verse 11, here, uh, here in the body of Christ, among my people, among the people of God, here in the body of Christ, uh, there is no Greek or Jew. There is no circumcised or uncircumcised. There is no black or white, I would add. There is no barbarian, no Scythian, no slave or free, but Christ is all, and he's in all. You see, Christians are not charged to create unity. If we would create it, we'd, we'd mess it up. We're not charged to create it. We're, we're charged to maintain it to maintain what God has already created. Paul would say in Ephesians 4 and verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so as we think about that, as Paul writes this to uh, Jews and Gentiles in that church at Ephesus, and as they come into this one body, he's reminding them that at the point of your baptism, uh, you have a serious threefold responsibility. And every Christian has that, whether we realize it or not, a, a serious uh, threefold responsibility. Number one, to understand that peace uh, exists between himself and all others in Christ by an act of God. That God created this thing that is already there. We need to uh, understand what he's done. Number two, that uh, uh, we have the responsibility to accept that peace. To accept what God has created. Then number three, we have the responsibility to live actively in that peace with fellow Christians. And to work out this thing of reconciliation that God has created and ordained within his body. You see, the Christian must no longer behave as if the dividing wall between the races still stands. But must learn to work with God to complete his work of, re of reconciliation among humanity. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and he does that in the body, in the church, of which we are members even today. And now some 17 years later, praise God, the divine work of recon reconciliation continues among the members of the bypass church. And we've had some successes, we've had some, some, some challenges, we had some difficulties working through some things, but God has blessed us to remain together, to grow. And I believe that has been an asset to the community. It's been a way of uh, uh, testifying to the body uh, about the unity that is ours in Christ and also testifying to the world 
of what God can do as we work through cultural differences and uh, background, I mean, uh, different worship styles, different ways of uh, dressing, different ways of uh, singing, all those things we have worked through by the grace of God to his glory and to his honor. And we're still, still, still working, still growing, still perfecting this thing called reconciliation. And that brings us to this topic this morning, racism. Racism, the Christian and racism. What is racism? What is racism? We need to ask ourselves some three questions this morning. What is racism and some of the causes of racism in and among us? A very sensitive topic to even talk about. Uh, Question number two, what is God's will for Christians in the area of race relations? What would God have us to do? How would God have us to respond? How would God have us to act in a world where even now, as I speak, uh, uh, 11 o'clock Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in many of our weeks? And it's still that way. What would God have us to do even about that? How should we even think about those topics in terms of race relations? And, And then number three, What action should Christians take to to align their heart and behavior more perfectly with the heart of God, thereby working with him to complete his glorious work of reconciliation? You see, when Paul talks about reconciliation in 2 Corinthians Corinthians 5, he says, God has committed unto us this same ministry. Christ was in the world, reconciling the world back to God, and now he's committed that unto each of us to carry it on and to bring about this glorious vision that God has for race relations. So question number one, what is racism? What is racism? In view of the racial upheaval and unrest in America in 2020, people need to understand that racism is neither a recent nor a local problem. It's been around a long time and will continue to plague our world, I believe, until our Lord returns. You see, the world will always be the world. We've been talking about uh, uh, the uh, chaotic, the the, uh, messed up world that we live in all this week. And we've been contrasting uh, what the world does versus what God would have us to do how God would have us to live. And so while the world will always be the world, we want to be like God. We want to imitate God and pattern our lives after him. And so racism has been around a long time, but we need to try to do what we can to align ourselves with the will of God. Racism takes many forms. It can happen in many places. It includes, but it's not limited to, the idea that other races are inferior by nature. And I've seen that on both sides, black and white, Uh, one uh, uh, getting the superiority over the other in different settings, in different uh, communities, different uh, uh, environments, where one would uh, 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 think that they're superior to the other and even say so and, and dictate certain things. It exists when we, whenever we prejudge or, or make, go back here. It exists whenever we prejudge or make assumptions about another person's character based on that person's skin color, ethnicity, national origin, hair texture, or color. And maybe you've seen that happen. You've uh, uh, been uh, a party to some of that. Uh, Sometimes you never see that until you have uh, occasions to be around people of different cultures, different hair color, different skin color, different hair texture. And we make assumptions because we don't really know that particular person or that particular culture. And so uh, those assumptions even have a bearing upon how we interact with that person, how we respond to them, how we uh, associate with them. Due to to these prejudgments, we discriminate, we dislike, we disassociate ourselves, we exclude, we abuse, we harass others 
even before we get to know them. What a shame. What a shame in a world where God has created so much diversity, so much diversity that uh, 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 equips us and empowers us to do so much more, but yet we limit ourselves because we look at the exterior and do not go beyond that, and we end up creating barriers that God has not created. Racism attempts to elevate self by putting others down. It does not need to involve violent or intimidating behavior. It may come in the form of racial slurs, name calling, or jokes. And the jokes sound comical until you're at the end of that joke and you're the one that's being criticized, you're the one that's being put down, and you may smile, but yet your feelings are hurt. Yet it puts a barrier there that makes it difficult to get along with one another. Racism can be revealed through people's actions as well as their attitudes. It can also be reflected, I believe, in systems and institutions. It can be reflected in housing, reflected in education. We've seen even with the pandemic, it's reflected in health care, access to uh, uh, affordable and uh, beneficial health care, where some races have been limited in their access to that, and therefore they have more uh, extenuating health conditions. Uh, uh, during the pandemic, many black folk died from COVID-19 because they, they had other health issues that were not attended to. It's many times because of sy systemic racism in the healthcare system, even in the criminal justice system. So many blacks uh, incarcerated, uh, a, a disproportionate number of black men incarcerated. And that says something about racial systems that we have. That's not true in every case, but racism can be systemic. Racism is often easily concealed. For example, someone may, may look through a list of job applicants and decide not to, in, to interview people with certain surnames, concluding that they are, quote, too black or too white or too Hispanic. And so we immediately X them off the list and get someone else who fits our uh, acceptability. So what causes racism? What causes racism in and among us as human beings? Racism may come from parental influence, I believe, and upbringing. We need to get at the root causes of it. Peter speaks of, for example, the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, 1 Peter 1 and verse 18 and 19. I can't think of anything more empty than racism, judging another before you even get to know the person, judging based upon the exterior, based upon the skin color. You see, no one is naturally racist by birth. Uh, we have three beautiful granddaughters, and they naturally associate with anybody. Black, white, Hispanic, uh, they have to be taught racism. Children learn racial prejudice by watching and listening to others. They're not born that way. And so we have to get uh, into the minds of parents and adults and help them to not raise up additional generations uh, that partake of racism. Racism may come from a bad experience. I knew a young lady, white lady, member of the church who had a bad experience with a black man who tried to rape her. And that clouded her perception of black people from that point forward. I, I can understand that. I can appreciate that. And so uh, may, maybe you've had a bad experience with someone of a, a certain race. Maybe you've been robbed. Maybe you've been uh, abused, you've been talked about, you've been uh, uh, violated by this person. And so you uh, form a view about all people of that particular race. 
And that's not necessarily the case. It's not fair to other people whom you have not met to judge them by that bad experience. Racism may come from fear in general. Solomon says in Proverbs 29, 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare. And so because we fear people in general, general we, 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 we fear blacks, we fear Hispanics, we fear even the white man. Because of that fear, we build walls and look at others with uh, uh, great suspicion, simply because we perceive them as different. And we put fearful labels and negative stereotypes on entire ethnic groups. And I've seen that and experienced that in the bypass church as we merged together and we saw these different cultures coming together and we began to, to tear down those stereotypes, to break down those walls that have been built up and to uh, uh, cause the races to get along with each other and stop using these phrases such as they are trying to hold us down and take away our rights, or they are taking all of our jobs, or they don't want us over them and making more money than them. I've heard statements like that, and I quickly work to debunk those statements, to try to help people get beyond that, to get beyond those racial stereotypes. Racism may be caused by pride, by doing what scripture warns against. Romans 12, verse 3 says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Some consider themselves better than others because of their genes or their ancestry. Scripture warns, however, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Galatians 6 and verse 3. And so we have to watch pride, arrogance thinking that we're better than others, that we are superior than others, that uh, uh, we have arrived when others have not. Racism may be caused by an unhealthy desire for power, for control. So unhealthy that when a person receives it, he becomes drunk on it. And he treats others the same way he was treated before he became empowered. You see, we all have to examine our desire for power, for control. Paul, even as an, an apostle, Paul had great power, great authority. But he said, God gave me that power, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 8, not for tearing others down, but for building others up. He said that also in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 10. God gave me that power. I mean, power should be used to help people to bless people. And I've seen that again on both sides, black and white, where uh, one is fearing the other because they're in power and then they want to get the power. And when they get the power, they do the very same thing that the other was guilty of. Church, the ultimate cause of racism is sin. What the Bible calls unrighteousness, Romans 3 and verse 10. John says that sin is lawlessness, 1 John 3 and verse 4. Again, Paul says sin has fallen short of God's glory, Romans 3, 23. All wrongdoing is sin, 1 John 5, 17. So racism is not just a matter of skin, <laughs> it's a matter of sin, S-I-N. And we need to call it what it is. And one thing we did in the... Uh, newly integrated bypass church. One thing we, we've tried to do over the years is uh, call things out, call out what's going on. When we form these two congregations into one, uh, merging together, we, we had what we called a unity steering committee. And it was, a, it was the job of that committee made up of both black and white men to uh, entertain anything that might divide us that might pull us apart, that might cause uh, that wall to be erected once again that Jesus has torn down. And so we talked about worship styles. We talked about dress. When you serve the communion, how should you dress? 
We were accustomed at the uh, predominantly black bypass church to dress in suits. Uh, the Magnolia Church was more accustomed to dress down. We had a young man even to come and serve the Lord's Supper with short pants on. That was anathema to us. <laughs> and so we had to deal with that. That was brought before the Unity Steering Committee to address that. And why do you encourage the young black men to dress up? Uh, why is it important that they uh, 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 dress up and uh, uh, see that as important? And how can we blend that together? How can we both give and take to make this thing work? When it comes to worship styles, when it comes to style of song leading, when it comes to unity even among the leadership, having both black and white elders, and all of that we talked about in the Unity Steering Committee to work some things out to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So we've seen what racism is, what causes, uh, some of the causes. Maybe you can think of some other causes. We have not exhausted that subject. And I in encourage you, challenge you to think about it, to ponder what brought about racism in your community in your neck of the woods? What are some uh, lingering uh, uh, racist tendencies that you might have? Because racism can be so deceptive to the point that we think we are accepting of others until we have to spend more time with them and associate with them and get along with them. But getting to the heart of the message this, this morning, what is God's will for Christians in the area of race relations. God is deeply concerned about race relations. The Bible begins and ends with God's vision of the unity of all people in his church. He would tell Abraham, leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to a place I will show you. And through your seed, I will bless all nations. Even then, God had a vision of blessing not just the uh, Jews who would be his chosen people, but, but he wanted to bless all people through Christ. And then when you end the Bible, we'll end with that passage, Revelation 7 and verse 9. We see that glorious vision of God, uh, 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 of, uh, of that throne of God. And around that throne are all nationalities of people from different languages and uh, tribes and heritage as we gather around the throne to worship God. And so from the beginning to the end, that's God's vision. So what's our role as we align ourselves with God's vision to make that happen, not just uh, over there. If it's going to happen over there, why not begin here? Start here. As we partake of that heavenly vision that's uh, in the kingdom, the kingdom of God is something that uh, uh, it's already but is not yet. I love that image there. So much in the kingdom of God that's yet to come that we see in that glorious vision. But yet uh, there's something that needs to be partaking of right now as we live for God and serve him. So what is God's will concerning race relations. You see, the Godhead has already made us one in the body, in the, in the church. The Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. God the Father, you see, has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 18. I often say to the members at Bypass, no Christian is in the church by accident. You're here by an act of God. The gracious father added them to his body, to his family, making them brothers and sisters. And I tell my granddaughters, when the third grandchild came along, they didn't vote on that. They didn't have a say in that. And they have to accept that third child as a vital, important member of the body. And we have to do that in the body of Christ. God does that. And then uh, the Holy Spirit God the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all made to drink 
of the one spirit. And so the spirit has a part in unifying and uh, uh, bringing about this unity. It has a say so in that. And where would we be without the unifying work of the son? God the son. God the son gave his blood to bring Jews and Gentiles together. Ephesians 2. And throughout that passage, Paul just breaks it down. He says, Christ himself is our peace, verse 14. He made peace, verse 14. And he came and he preached peace. You get the idea that Jesus wants some harmony, right? He wants some togetherness. He wants us to be together in his body. And you can't think of anything more uh, opposed to each other than Jews and Gentiles in the first century. You see, racism is not anything new. And Paul is dealing with it in this Ephesian letter. He's hitting it head on. He would even hit it head on with Peter, a fellow apostle, who before the uh, Jews showed up, he uh, he would associate with the Gentiles. But then when the Jews showed up, he withdrew back. And Paul rebuked him to the face because he was wrong. And so that, again, shows us how deceptive racism can be if even an apostle struggled with it. I know we struggle with it. And we have to admit that and overcome that by the grace of God. But it begins with understanding God's vision, God's uh, view of what he wants. In the church, Christians from all races and nationalities, they have peace not only with God, but also with each other. They know and should be proud of their race. But all of that is secondary secondary to being of the Christian race. I tell the members of the former Bypass Church, be proud of who you are. Be proud, as James Brown would say, I'm black and I'm proud. Be proud of that. But I say to the uh, white brothers, be proud of who you are. And don't be so naive as to say, I don't see color. I do see color. As I look at this audience, I see color. God made color. And it's a blessing, not a hindrance. Be proud of who you are, but don't let that pride cause you to discriminate against someone who is unlike you. Get to know them, accept them as who they are. But start with a healthy understanding of who you are. And out of that healthiness, you can then see the health of other people who are unlike yourself. So what actions, what actions should Christians take to align ourselves, our hearts and our behavior more perfectly with the vision of God, thereby working with him to complete his glorious work of reconciliation? If you have your Bibles, look at Ephesians as Paul just breaks this down. I'm going to hit this very quickly for sake of time in the Ephesian letter. Ephesians 4, he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you, reading from the NIV, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with each other in love. Keep in mind the uh, setting here, Jew and Gentile in the same body getting along with each other. The middle wall has been torn down and Paul is exhorting them. Now you get to maintain what God has created. Verse four, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So what should Christians do? Number one, we need to check our attitude. Check our attitude in the body of Christ, black and white, Jew, Gentile, Hispanic. As we blend the cultures together, check your attitude. Always do an attitude check. When I was a director of Sardis Lake Christian Camp in North Mississippi, we'd often begin the day with the young people attitude check. And they come up and uh, 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 go through the drill as they check their attitude. It makes for a better day when your attitude is right. And Paul addresses the attitude here. What are some attitudes uh, that we need to have as uh, Christians to maintain the unity? He mentions some six different 
attitudes or qualities that help us to keep the church unified. Humility, gentleness, uh, meekness under control, strength under control. He talks about patience, being patient with each other. Oh, how we needed that when these two churches merged together. Being patient with each other. Understanding the other person, putting yourself in another person's shoes, not making assumptions, not being quick to accuse, but quick to understand, to have a discussion, to talk matters out, not just to get your feelings hurt and then run off and start another church somewhere else. <laughs> but let's work this thing out. Let's maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We got to be uh, patient with each other, be able to forbear with each other, the same way Jesus has been forbearing with us. And crown that with love, having goodwill for the other person, whether you know them or not, getting to know them so you can then love them. And then diligent, putting forth every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Check our attitude. Number two, we need to check our uh, the with the attitude here, someone said a bad attitude is like a flat tire. You can't go anywhere till you change it. <laughs> and so it's true of the church. We limit ourselves and limit the kingdom uh, of God, uh, the local church, because of bad attitudes. Attitude is everything. But then number two, we must check our facts. Our facts. Everyone is entitled to their opinions, uh, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And the world will always be the world. The world will have different opinions about these facts. But two plus two will always be four, regardless of what the world says. And the same is true of these seven ones that Paul mentions here. Seven ones. Someone said I would sacrifice anything for unity except truth. I would not sacrifice these seven ones that he mentions here. I want to put, it, put them in a certain order. Uh, it helps to remember them, but it's so uh, awesome to think about these facts that God has put forth that helps us to maintain the unity. We have to realize there's only one God. In spite of what the world says, one God and Father of all who's above all and through all and in all. And that one God sent the one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ who lived among us and uh, uh, dealt with uh, racism, dealt with prejudice. He went to the Samaritans, uh, even though the Samaritans and the Jews had no dealings with each other. He went to them anyway. He dealt with it. And when he went back to heaven, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send uh, another comforter. So the one Lord sent the one spirit. And the one spirit guided the apostles into all truth. And so therefore, the, in the, the, the one spirit gave us the one faith, the one faith, the one system of belief that we hold dear, that we hold on to as members of the body of Christ. And in that one faith, we read about the one baptism. And that one baptism puts us into the one body, which is his church. And once we're in the church, we have that one hope. Praise God. Facts of unity. We need to check our facts. Someone said the truth is like a lion. You don't have to defend it. Just let it loose <laughs> and it will defend itself. And we need to stand on the truth. When we talk, talk about uh, merging two cultures, we're not talking about compromising truth. When we talk about even worship styles, we're not talking about compromising truth. We're talking about the things that uh, we can uh, change as we uh, bring these cultures together, but the word of God does not change. It's still the same. And we stand on that. So check your attitude first, then check your facts. And then number three, check your gifts. Your gifts. As Paul mentions gifts here that God has given to the church to help maintain the unity. So unity comes from leadership recognizing their role in the church. He talks about these gifts, gifts for the common good, the common good of the whole body. What are those gifts? Uh, he mentions them in this text that so we don't have time to break it all down. But in verse uh, 
Number eight, he says, sorry, verse number seven. Uh, to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. Jesus, when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men, gifts to the church. What are those gifts? First of all, they're specific gifts of leadership. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teaching pastors to prepare God's people for works of service, to build them up, to equip them so we'll maintain this unity that God has created. And we have no living apostles, no living prophets, but they speak to us through the word. We do have living evangelists and living teaching pastors whom God has given to the body to equip the body, help the body grow up, help the body mature in the faith, and to help the body maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And he's given also uh, general gifts of fellowship, where you have every member, every joint supplying something. And it's the challenge of leadership to find those members and incorporate them into the body, those new converts, and to see what gifts God has given them and uh, uh, encourage them to plug those gifts into the growth and development of the body so that every joint is supplying something and we're growing and maintaining the unity and we're speaking the truth in love to each other. And church is a beautiful thing when that happens. It's an ongoing thing as a leadership and fellowship work together to glorify God. Peter would say we need to use whatever gift we have received to serve others, being faithful stewards of God's manifold grace that is given to the body. When we merge together, I told the black brothers of the former bypass church, I mean, you need to step up. Step up. You have gifts. You have talents. You have abilities that God has given you. And, 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 and uh, Brother Wayne Moore told the members of the Bi Magnolia Church to step up. Let's all bring these gifts to the table. Let's all see how God has gifted us. And we all use those gifts together. Together we are stronger than what we would have been divided, separated. You see, bringing the races together does not make us weaker. Brothers, I believe it makes us stronger. And we have a greater witness to the world. We, 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 we uh, preach unity and togetherness, but yet when they come into our assemblies, they see segregation and other things. Well, what happens when we, when we bring that together? A powerful testimony to the world. And so we close with this idea. Again, Ephesians 4, verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Let me modify that. Let me paraphrase that. I believe what Paul is really saying to us today as we think about racism and the Christian, make every effort to allow God to complete the work of reconciliation among us. And it is going to be a challenge. It is going to uh, demand that you look deep within your own heart and soul, that you examine where you are, that you examine the uh, assumptions you've made about other races, that you sit down and talk with others unlike yourself, that you hear what they have to say, that you listen without prejudging, that you understand their cultural setting. And that's true of both sides. You sit and listen and understand, and out of that understanding, there's growth. There's maturity. There's the ability to see your brother and to see their hurts, see their struggles, understand their fears, and help one another bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Make every effort to allow God to complete the work of rec reconciliation among us. And that means we don't create anything. You see, you can take a cat and a dog and 
You think you're creating unity by tying their tails together. You have not created unity. You created a, a mess, <laughs> confusion. And so God didn't leave it up to us to create, create anything. He says, it's already done. God has done his work. The spirit has done his work. Jesus has done his work. He's torn down that wall. He's made us one. Now act like it. Accept it. Appreciate it. Celebrate it. Demonstrate it to a world that is still divided. And show them what it looks like. You see, the church of Christ was unified long before you and I became a part of it. God created it that way. Now it's up to us to accept it. How do we do that? Check your attitude. Check your facts. Check your gifts. And then remember what God has in store. God has this glorious vision, church. Revelation 7 and verse 9, John says, I saw this multitude that no one could number, standing before God, a great multitude from every tribe and nation and language and people standing before him, worshiping him. That's God's vision of his church. And if that's his vision over here, we need to start doing that right now over here. As we live for him and glorify him, God wants rec racial reconciliation, someone said, not just integration. You see, in the 60s, we were forced to integrate the schools. I remember that. I was in, in, in the fifth grade when they integrated black and white schools. And we were afraid. We had all kinds of fears, all kinds of doubts, all kinds of preconceptions. And oftentimes when integration is forced, it does nothing to change the attitude. It does nothing to change the heart. It does nothing to uh, remold your thinking into the image and the thinking of Christ. And so God wants more than just integration. And so when we join those two congregations together, we were not just talking about integration. We were talking about racial reconciliation and what that really means and that's when you begin to do some things not by force but by choice out of gratitude and appreciation for what God has done in your life God has saved me added me to his church made me a member of this body of uh, so many different cultures and and generations and uh, uh, races and now it's up to me to come in and work with him to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and realize that God has equipped me to do that. First John 4, 19, we love, why? Because he first loved us. And he's poured within our hearts love whereby we can love each other, people unlike ourselves. And what a testimony that'll be to the world as we live out the vision that God has for his glorious church in the ages to come. God bless you.